So today we're here with Pastor Jess McKernan. Uh, hey, buddy. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Jess is here because at the time of this recording, it's the summer of 2021. Mm. So only the Lord knows when this will actually be released to all five people that actually watch this. But <laughs> <laughs> I watch it. I watch it. That's you. I Nate. actually answered and responded to it. Did you really? Oh, yeah. Well, I said go. yes when Nate oh, said, Nate "Say said. yes." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, because, I mean, well, that kind of leads even to where we could start the conversation yeah. is you and I have a mutual friend in Nate Wagner, mm-hmm. but, I mean, I had an opportunity to meet you um, for the first time in Ensenada, Mexico. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that, but it was the year 2001. Oh, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, probably one. It was when I was in, in Bible there. college, and so you were at a church mm-hmm. at Calvary Santa Barbara, and you guys would do Christmas outreaches where we would take gifts to different people and that's the right. Domingos from uh, Horizonte Church. That's where we would connect. But that's where we first met. But, um, you know, at the time of this recording, it's summer of 2021. You're here today to teach Psalmer time, Psalm 128. Mm-hmm. Um, I was listening to it on the way back. I was at a church in Fort Walton today sharing and teaching there. But, um, but yeah, I mean... You know, one of the ways to just begin this is just to tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're from Long Beach. Mm-hmm. Maybe how 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 did we end up connecting in Ensenada from the moment of birth to the moment of yeah. Ensenada? But I mean, just a little bit of yeah. who you are, well, just a bit of your story. Okay, you know? not everything. But. So, grew up in Long Beach, California, 1978, August 14th, hmm. and uh, was brought up in the Christian church. Actually, Costa Mesa Calvary Chapel was kind of home where mom and dad got saved, and then. In like the hippie days? In the hippie days. So they would go to the tent revivals. They would hear the music. Oh, yeah. It was it was the very beginning. So Mm. dad gave his life to the Lord first. It was Mm. an eye opener to my mom. Mm. She goes and hears Daryl Mansfield and Mm. all these old school musicians. And then the gospel is being preached. And and so one family member after the other, they'd get saved. And, and then me and my sister, which I, I, I give thanks to God for, we got to be raised in a Christian home. Mm-hmm. And I grew up at Calvary Chapel Seal Beach with Ron Wilkins. That was kind of where I began elementary, or I was in the elementary age uh, during that time. Then we moved on to Steve May's church at Calvary oh, Chapel wow. South Bay. Wow. For a few years in my junior high, maybe high school. Who sounded just like Chuck Smith, Steve <laughs> Mays. He could Close. Well, he was so good at that. Yeah. yeah. He's and with he, the Lord now. He's with the Lord. Yeah. And he had some really good nuggets for me as I was going to Ireland. I'll maybe speak about that later. But hmm. um, And then, yeah, the Lord eventually moved us up to Calvary Chapel or moved us to Santa Barbara. And then oh, wow. I was introduced to Bruce Holland, who introduced me to Britt Merrick, got mm-hmm. involved in reality ministry, mm-hmm. just serving, being part and uh, met Nate Wagner, who spoke here not too long ago. Yeah. We served in the kids' ministry there for years, went on missions trips, and that's when we met yeah, that's there, when we in met there in Sonata. So what was the nature of your, your ministry there at Santa Barbara? You mentioned mm-hmm. kids' ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, I don't want to tell your whole story, but that's I know that right. you also had other seasons of ministry in the San Ynez Valley, and like you mentioned, Ireland. Yeah. But what was the nature of like getting into ministry? I mean, like you mm-hmm. mentioned... You're from Long Beach. Your family moves to Santa mm-hmm. Barbara. I mean, it sounds like you grew up in a phenomenal background, especially with yeah. Calvary. Were you just always going to be in ministry? I mean, or like yeah. how did you go from a guy in Long Beach to starting to work in a church? What's mm-hmm. that like? I mean, because a lot of guys, <clears throat> they have, at least I did. I mean, am I called to do this? Am mm-hmm. I supposed to do this? Is this yeah. what I want to do? So, you know, how did that work out for you? So the doors opened up as I was serving down at Calvary Santa Barbara and in reality in that ministry, kind of driving vans for Brit, um, helping around the church. I was serving down in the kids ministry with Nate and kind of like what Nate said, just I was saying yes after each opportunity and the door would open. I said yes to it. And little by little, um, I was, I guess, seen more by the, some of the guys at Calvary Chapel, uh, Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara. Rick Soto was one of them. Oh, that's right, yeah. And Rick Soto was kind of the beginnings. He was the one the Lord used to encourage me into full-time ministry. Mm. One day after leading worship at, I think it was uh, one of the high school meetings, he came up to me and said, hey, would you be interested in being my assistant? So at mm. this time, I just loved being in the church. I served. I was a volunteer for years. 
And that's all I, I assumed that I would be doing. Um, I worked at a hotel as a bellman. Yeah, the, what was um, the name of that? It was called the Fest Parker's Double Tree. That's right, the Double Tree. The yeah, it's a beautiful hotel in San Beautiful, yeah, I yeah. loved it. I yeah. loved working with people. But yeah, that gift of hospitality. Hospitality, people. people. serving people. I worked yeah. in restaurants before. I yeah. thought really hospitality and that hotel management side was going to be kind of my your path my path career, right but yeah. then when rick came up to me that one sunday that was an open door it was like i didn't know at that time but it was kind of the beginning of god slowly bringing me into ministry he i started mm. one day a week working with him as an assistant mm. and then eight months later jim stretchberry mm. you can share more about him if you like but <laughs> he invited me and said hey would you like to work in kids ministry jim i was stretchberry. scared to death yeah Sweating bullets. I yeah. knew I had, you know, I had no really Bible knowledge yet. Kind of did, but not much. But I just knew, okay, Lord, I'm just going to say yes, mm. and, and and went for it. So you kind of really lived out that principle of being available to serve, and mm. not really kind of coming in with a preconceived notion of it has to look this way. These yeah. are my gifts and talents. This yeah. is what I need to be no doing. Clue, yeah. But really, how can I come alongside the church and serve? Serve with a good attitude, flexibility, and then the leadership just said, we want you one day a week. One day. Eight months later, no. we want you. Yeah. Interesting. And I think, you know, if I were to you speak to anybody out there listening, you know, if, if you're considering ministry and thinking about it, and I, I think, you know, you, you really is, that it's, that, it's that one verse, be faithful in the little things. Yeah. So I think faithfulness, if you're faithful in those little things, God's just going to continue to give you more. And more. So you remember that phrase that we would often hear at the end of a long summer's day in Santa Barbara? Ten questions. We've got to get our, t- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. get our ten, ten questions. questions. Get our TPs up. <laughs> now, you and I know what we're talking about there, but talk a little yeah. bit about what you and I ended up doing oh shoulder to shoulder yeah. like for at least two summers, I, I, maybe more. I, I don't maybe really remember. Um, but what was our what was ministry like for us when you're talking yeah. about getting involved? Like, What did that look like? Was it... I just read the Bible all day and study and give these amazing messages and people's faces are filled with the Shekinah <laughs> glory. Or like, what What did ministry look like in those first few um, days? In the beginning days, it was uh, it was hard work. It was, uh, you know, getting up early, um, setting up tents Your in a cold, camps. damp mornings yeah. on Santa Barbara coast. These 40-foot teepee yeah, poles. Yeah, teepees. And we're, we're just talking about one specific yeah. event. But yeah, we take that event and it would be, you know, a week long of being with kids every day mm-hmm. and then, you know, um, just loving on them, sharing, you know, um, stories out of the Bible, yeah, really simple, themes, good like stuff. Yeah, themes theme or whatever, yeah. Then we'd have questions for their, you know, leaders to take the kids and, you know, into the tents. And so after 12 hours of being in the summer, we had to come and like write the curriculum at <laughs> yeah. night and go back out there and do it again. Yeah, long yeah. days, long days, a lot of work, mm-hmm. um, and just giving of yourself. And right. So, and then, you know, you had Wednesday nights. Right. That if you remember those days, I remember? Do. I do after remember a full day of camp, we'd have a service then. And then Sunday would come and you'd have three, three services, services there. And I would be, you know, completely exhausted. Yeah. Uh, I've, you know, if, if we did another kind of leadership thing, I probably would touch on how to maybe set some more boundaries up. So <laughs> I would not want to say, I never want to be, you know, here right. again. I it got to very the full. point where yeah. I go, yeah, I don't want to. I don't. And at that anymore. season in our lives, n- you know, neither of us nor anyone that we were working with really were married or had yeah. young children. I mean, I was paid a very high salary of five hundred dollars a month. I lived in a closet at your house. <laughs> <laughs> we lived in it off an alleyway. We did. I mean, how big was the Curly House? Six hundred square feet. Okay. Three guys. So we each sh- we each got our two hundred square feet <laughs> <laughs> on top You'd of see each your other. Breath in the tub when you're trying to take a shower and oh, keep the curtain yeah. up. And I mean, we say we're, it was in Santa Barbara, beautiful area. You know, suffering for Jesus yeah. there, but still that dynamic of just um, doing whatever you were told to or asked do. to do. Asked to do. Yeah, I wasn't, think. Yeah. We were just open, young guys, you know, not many responsibilities, no. love the Lord. Cool things were happening, of course, Yeah. in the college group. Yep. I think that was encouragement was to serve amazing. the Lord yeah. and, uh, yeah, just being available and, and watching God just as he does so wonderfully and perfectly to help us navigate and lead the way for us. So in that season, two things I want to hit on, uh, you know, you're training your hands during mm-hmm. that time. But also I remember Aaron Austin, mm-hmm. uh, an elder at the church at the time, kind of investing in both your heart and your head, you know, yeah. in the word of God. Yeah. 
So that dynamic wanted to speak to just to the discipleship that you experienced. But then the second thing is, that's also the season where you met a girl named Rebecca Tenpenny. That's right. So two things that are really good, getting mm-hmm. to know God's word and getting to know your your future spouse, mother of your children. So maybe just walk us through like, because you know, we come mm. from a church background where the phrase is more is caught than taught, yeah. you know, sometimes. Yeah. and um, But still there's some teaching, some training that is needed. So... I know Aaron Austin. Maybe we'll look at that first. What was your Bible training like? Because I know you went to Bible college classes a little bit. Eventually. Yeah, eventually. But initially, what was that like for you? So initially, just real quick, grew up in a Christian home. Dad, mom read Bible. I would read a little bit, but didn't have much Bible knowledge. Again, just served. And then when I started Santa Barbara, instead of God taking me in a Bible college like your experience, it was more hands-on. I just took the steps in faith, but then God brought these perfect, yeah. wonderful, faithful men yeah. saw, okay, God's hand on this guy. Right. I'm going to pour my life into him. Right. Uh, Aaron Austin was one. I would meet with him. Kai, uh, early. We met early, 6 o'clock, 6.30, every Wednesday morning yeah. for, uh, it might have been two, maybe three years. Wow. And we went through the whole Bible. Wow. So he would give me reading, you know, for the week. Um, would you always do it? Yeah, he he would actually lock me out of his office if oh. I did not complete the reading. Oh. He so was good he accountability. Was yeah, good accountability. There's but. that phrase: people do what's <laughs> inspected, not what's expected. So there's Aaron Austin for you. Right? Aaron Austin was good, he, but he inspected. loved me. He yeah, he did. He met he with me. God. He listened yeah. to me. He every week, if I had questions, what I read, he would he would answer them. Uh, we just had a wonderful time of of uh, fellowship, and for me, definitely learning mm. and so god just used that aaron austin and, and of course more guys down the line did the dave same brown. thing dave brown yeah. again rick soto, rick soto. um your dad in, yeah. in some you know some ways well you and i during away, that but. season of santa barbara we had this unique experience with my brother mm-hmm. where we were able to go on a footsteps of the apostles mm-hmm. cruise and we met some men, uh, pastors, you know, who are yeah. just one. But there were two guys, one very in- influential for me and one very influential for you. Absolutely. I, I got connected to John Corson on that trip and then ended up doing some training with him in Applegate and just stayed connected to his son, Ben, and, and he for years. And then John Miller. Uh, John Miller. Just talk about that so, influence in yeah. your life. Yeah. So back when was that? 2004, Four. I yeah, think. Yeah, we were old. Oh, 17 years long ago. Long time ago. But boy, what a great years, trip. Yeah. And thank you for inviting yeah, me. Yeah, we got that going. Yeah. Neil great. and a yeah. bunch of people, they got together and helped me get there. But yeah, I, when we went there, um, John Corson was there. Jack Hibbs was there. That's Lloyd right. Poley Lloyd was Poley, there. That's right. But one in particular, John Miller, who now is a dear friend and a mentor, I call mm. him in my life, uh, we just connected. Mm. And from that day forward, uh, especially when I went off to Ireland, right, that was yeah. a big part. I reconnected with him, and he was the one God used to help me, again, go through the Bible, mm-hmm. listen to his teachings, kind of like a Chuck Smith right. series. But he's like a John. surgeon with the scriptures. Oh, like so good. Like he, yeah, he's very gifted. Tons of wisdom, but he really helped me understand that— um, well, the the value in Scripture that the Scripture is our should and always be our authority. Um, help me how to exposit the Word of God, mm-hmm. uh, study the Word of God, mm-hmm. how to communicate the Word of God, and just he, what I loved about him, which I appreciate all the guys that have been. He was approachable. Mm-hmm. I would go down to Marietta, mm-hmm. go to his homiletics yeah, class. College, yeah. I, he would help. He would, uh, let me spend the night at his house, take really? me surfing. So wow. it, he was pouring in, but Real loving mentor. on me, yeah. mentoring me, modeling for me. But again, he was always approachable. I can ask him any question and he would I answer I think that's it. one of the biggest things about a lot of those Calvary guys from that. If Chuck's <clears> the first generation, guys like that are the mm-hmm. second. I'm not sure where the line is. But some of those guys are accessible where yeah. they, hey, I've got his number or I've got... Well, but they also anytime. have published works yeah. and <laughs> huge congregations. Huge. But the, the accessibility seems like that's a must in mm-hmm. order for genuine discipleship to happen. Yeah. We'll come back to John because we want to talk about Ireland. But before yeah. Ireland... There was a ten penny in your life. Yes, you know? Rebecca. You met Rebecca during yeah. this. So how did that happen? Did you meet her on a mountain somewhere? And, yeah, and, Rebecca. And how did you meet Rebecca so, at ten penny? So um, in that time, it's funny. I think I was actually still at fifteen fourteen Laguna Street, which was oh, yeah. this house in Santa Barbara. My mom and dad rented. And, Beautiful. Uh, it was fun house. Cool house. Yeah. It was where we all fellowshiped like us in our single yeah. lives. Yeah. yeah. And during that time, when we were in reality in the college group, no one was married yet. My sister went off to beauty school in Goleta, the Goodlands. That's right. Santa Barbara yeah. area. 
And there was another girl that went to beauty school, Rebecca mm, Tenpenny, at that time. And mm-hmm. they connected, so she became my sister's best friend. Ah. <clears throat> so my sister invited her over to my house or our home and uh, almost every week. And we, that's how we, we began to get to know each other, but didn't really... Um, say move forward in a relationship until probably a year and a little after they graduated from beauty school so i was probably it was before we went to the curly yeah yeah, yeah. still in kids ministry right um serving yeah, at santa I remember barbara my first summer there would have been like 2002 mm-hmm. and nate this mutual friend that we're speaking of yourself Han- andy robottom yep. you, other guys yep. no girlfriends no so girlfriends. it was like wow what an interesting summer i come back Everyone has They're a girlfriend. Big girlfriend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, going to be getting married Yeah, soon. and getting married. And I was like, wow, I missed the boat, I guess. Like, <laughs> You guys were all, there was a whole different experience that yeah. second summer, but somewhere in there, 2002, 2003, 2004. Yeah, it was right in you there. Guys met. When did you guys get married? So I Put think you on when you and I were in Greece with oh, your yeah. dad yeah. on that trip, I want to say just months after that, months I after forget that. when that was, but um, it was March of 2005. Okay. So... Got married, dated for two and a half years, got married. And and then lived in the Curly house lived, with your bride. Neil went off Kicked to Florida. Out, me and Nate. Yeah, Nate was done. already married. Jeremy, Jeremy our friend, Sutherland, yeah. he moved in. I kicked him out and <laughs> brought my beautiful <laughs> fruitful vine that I talked yeah, about I today. Yeah, I heard that in the message today, yeah. <laughs> in 600 house. square feet, honey. Yeah, here you Make go, sweetheart. Home. Yeah. And we were there for a few months, and then from then on, yeah, the Lord opened another door. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that experience, yeah. Over the mountain. The next so, season. If you are familiar with Santa Barbara, it's on this beautiful coast. And just mm. right there on the coast, there's also this beautiful mountain range. And over that mountain range is this cool valley called the San Inez Valley. Mm. It's probably six, no, let's see, how many miles? It's probably a 40-minute drive from Santa yeah, Barbara. I would say so, yeah. But in that time, uh, when I was married, it was probably 2000, oh boy, six, seven. There was a lot of people coming over that mountain mm. to come to Calvary, Santa Barbara. So Ricky oh, Ryan, who is our right, pastor, Rick right. Soto who already actually lived over there, saw this need saying, hey, there's a need over there. And then by that time, Rick sort of moved there. Mm-hmm. He was starting his home. And then organically, the spirit kind of put on his heart to start a church. Mm-hmm. And before it was announced by Ricky Ryan that we're going to plant another Calvary Chapel in the San Inez Valley, God moved Rebecca and I and our family over to San Inez. Oh, wow. I was just going to be a commuter. Oh, wow. And I did it for six months. Did but you really? Okay. Before it was even mentioned... Uh, we said, well, we're living here. This is where God has us. But then once we moved there, January, oh, I think it was, let's see, yeah, maybe 2008. I forget now, but um, two I know months. I Nella came in that season because yeah, I remember she, visiting you. That's right. She you came in seven. So maybe yeah. it was just right after that eight. Yeah, somewhere in there. Two months later, Ricky says, hey, we're planting a church in, mm. in the San Jose Valley. And that's what confirmed saying, wow, Lord, maybe that's what you want. You've wow. called us here to help Rick plan right. the ranch church and what did you do there what more kids camps tps i mean what was that <laughs> yeah <laughs> 10 uh, questions 40 you know, foot TPs. for if you're a church panel you know this but when you start something organically you're wearing multiple hats that's so right santa barbara kids ministry full on yeah you're focused you're like a specialist that's where yeah, you are. yeah that's what i did for seven years and now you know there's opportunity to teach a little bit to help there's discipleship. You have worship ministry, which I kind of did fall into because I did. do play you guitar did lot, and yeah. I love worship. Mm-hmm. But also overseeing kids ministry there as the kids and the youth were coming in. Mm-hmm. So it was multiple haps, counseling. And I'll tell you, the ranch was a another great opportunity to learn. That's God right. taught me a lot. The That's good, right. the bad, and the ugly. That's right. And I'm so... Church I, planning's hard. It no is. No matter what, if you start with a big budget and number, mm-hmm. it's just the nature of it is a challenge. It's a challenge. You know? yeah. But you look... Now, Adam, you're so, Lord, thank you for letting me go through that time because you do learn so much. And I remember I was visiting the West Coast at that time when you were living there in uh, the San Inez Valley. And I had just driven up from Santa Barbara. I think I was seeing Nate and a handful Mm -hmm. of others and went up to see you. And um, I wouldn't say that you were, you know, he's done in San Inez. It wasn't like that, but it just sensed like, well, man, there might be a next chapter coming. Mm -hmm. And I remember that conversation vaguely now, but I remember after that conversation, two weeks or something like that, you called me and said, Neil, I remember that conversation we had. I'm moving to Lithuania. And I yeah. said, what? <laughs> that was one of the ideas. Lithuania. <laughs> the Baltics. Litha what? <laughs> Wait, what are you talking I about? I remember that, yeah. No, don't tell your mom and dad that. Don't tell them I told <laughs> you to. <laughs> 
don't tell Rick. They're coming for me. I said something like, maybe pray, talk to your mom, talk to your yeah. dad. But tell us what happened there, because that eventually obviously led, we're speaking about Ireland. But yeah. I mean, tell us, so you're in Santa Barbara in ministry. You're in the San Inez Valley in ministry. For seven years. For se yeah. And then all of a sudden, the Emerald Isle somehow yeah. comes on your heart. So what about that? So I'd say probably within the, maybe the sixth year of being in the San Inez Valley, being there, it was a great time, great church. But a lot of us talk about you get this kind of holy discontent, discontent right so it's, right. it's a good one it's not right. a bad one but you know something god's doing a work in you right you know maybe a, our season's coming to an end and right. maybe a new one but i had no idea what that was other than mm. we did this church plant and my wife and i loved doing it it was fun uh, we learned a lot let's do it again mm. the question was where and what's that look like? And then you came on that trip, right. which I'm so glad God brought you. Right, because yeah, just to say hi, basically. Neil, for those that are, are watching this thing, God's used him in such a, a big way to help me navigate through ministry, which mm. so friends are important. The mm -hmm. body of Christ is important to help you. That's right. You know, figure out which direction the Lord That's has right. taken you. And so Neil used, or God used Neil to ask me, I think it was like one or two questions. I think you, we got to the point in our conversation where you said, Jess, where do you see you hang your, your hat? Hang your I think hat. you said that. Okay. And that just Don't really, that it stopped all, me in my tracks. Oh, yeah. Because of where I was, I go, I have no idea. And I think we talked about if it's not here, mm -hmm. then where is it? Mm -hmm. So that question mm -hmm. led that to timing. another question. The yeah. timing was just perfect. It's, yeah. I was looking for something like that. Right, okay, right, if it's right. not saying as, then it's somewhere else. Mm. Lord, show me the way. Mm. And then that was the beginning. Probably it was a two-year process mm. from that point. Okay, so it wasn't like the next day you It wasn't up. the next day. It takes time, and I'm learning God's not in a hurry. That's he, right. He takes it's his time. It's a great book titled by Warren Wearsby, God's That's Not right. in a Hurry. That's a great book. But anyways, yeah. It's, it's something he wants to take you through. And so we prayed. We even went on a trip through the United States to see, Lord, is this, do you want us to plant somewhere else in the U.S.? It was no, totally off the table. And then I thought, well, I, I did something that I thought I'd never become or do is become a missionary. I thought right. those people were crazy yeah. <laughs> and I would never want to raise well, are, money. <laughs> <laughs> never would want to do that. Ian and, you know, then went to yeah. Ethiopia. I go, yeah. man, I don't want to do that. No, but, I can understand you know, that. a year or two later, God really changed that for me. And we said, okay, Lord, show us the way. So I just kind of prayed, looked over in Europe. I didn't, I wasn't led to do anything else or look in any other countries other than somewhere in Europe. But the turning point was I, I did go to Ireland. Mm -hmm. I don't know ten years before yeah. this with Our Santa Barbara was with Troy Spillman, yeah. which I forgot him. But Troy Spillman was another big, big in, life, influence yeah. in my life. But yeah. um, went over there. They spoke English. Great time. And, and so for some reason, God used that memory, and He just kind of started. To, that was the heartbeat. Ireland, Ireland, Lithuania was a heartbeat. Maybe one day, but just that became less and less the heartbeat. Great place Ireland, to yeah, maybe, yeah, or Poland or whatever. Who mm. knows? But Ireland was the heartbeat. Mm. And again, after prayer, me and my wife finally said, "Okay, we need to take a scout trip." We went over there. Yeah. During that time, you and I were going through some of that church you know, planners. Yeah, manual. church planners. Yeah, thank you, Bruce Zachary. So Bruce Zachary yeah, Bruce Zachary, manual. thank yeah. you for that. Super helpful. And uh, when we went over there, yeah, it was it was hard. It's scary. You took a huge step of faith. Huge step of faith. Because if memory serves me right, you lived in a sheep farm or mm -hmm. something for like that's the first right. month. Like yeah. that's where you were going. I'm living yeah. in a sheep barn. And before, so be for again, I, I think if there's church planners listening to yeah. us or <laughs> interested or anybody in ministry, we did finish well. That was our goal. Yes. Finish well at yep. the ranch. Yep. Communicate in time when that is all getting, you know, God's putting that on your heart. You're getting more clarity. I, I spoke to the elders, Rick Soto. Right. They understood before Processed I even took the scout trip. That's right. That's right. So there's really a good timing and yeah. God honors that. He I blesses think he does. it. I agree with that. And there's a process there. So make sure, you know, you really seek the Lord for that process. Yeah. And so, Because church planting can be almost like clip bait to the ambitious mm -hmm. or to those that are yeah. looking, are unhappy and having to kind of take direction from a leader. You know, sometimes it can be like, well, That's if right. I had my church That's or my right. ministry, I would. And unfortunately, you and I have been around long enough to see individuals who approach it that way. Mm -hmm. And it, it just never on. works. That's it never right. bears fruit. You always want to be called to something, not necessarily called away from something. Mm -hmm. But God's calling me to do this, you know, like or right. taking a step some direction. So I and think that, it's yeah, notable that you 
you did your diligence, but you also paid your respects. Mm-hmm. Like you, you wait, did things the right you way. Stay humble. Yeah. You 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 com- completely submit to that authority that you're under. Right. Don't disrespect it. Trust the Lord in the process, and He will He will show you yeah. the way. Guarantee. Yeah. God's able to that. do anything He wants. Yeah. So that's, there's that verse in the Old Testament that He can kind of divert or channel or lead the heart of kings. Mm-hmm. So if he can do that with a king, yeah. he can do that with our pastors. Or, right. You know what I mean? So we can That's trust right. that uh, God's in control. He doesn't need me to manipulate or mm. to force or to push. It's good. I mean, I can work hard, but I don't. it's not on me. Yeah, you know? we don't have to, yeah, f- yeah, push it. That's a good... So by the time you and your wife had planned to go to Galway, Ireland, where you landed and planted New Hope Calvary Chapel, Yeah. You're no kids, 15 kids, three mm-hmm. kids. I mean, what, what's gone on with your family? So at that time when we, we, when we get moved and got to Ireland, that was 2015 mm-hmm. was our first year there, January. Mm. Wow, cold. We had, f- yeah, cold. Free is like the one of the coldest days. <laughs> it happened to be our day. The plane was coming in all crazy. The wind was blowing. It just snowed. Oh, Tim, wow. who picked us up, said, you've picked the coldest day. <laughs> and, and me and my wife, it's so funny you said that. She goes, what did we get ourselves yeah. into? Freezing. Yeah. Coming all from Southern California. Yeah. planting. They're dead. <laughs> First day. It's freezing. <laughs> and we're not prepared. We have like, you got know, your, uh, Southern California clothes. On. Yeah. But we, yeah, we had four kids. We have Anella, Leah, Everly, and Kellen. Mm-hmm. Young. Actually, Kellen was just born four months ago. Wow. Four and months before you went to Ireland. Four months, yeah. Wow. So really at that time, yeah. And then those three years, that's all really our kids knew, especially Kellen. I think that's so interesting because, I mean, I have children, you have children like we just heard, and you had a job. I mean, mm-hmm. you were in ministry and you're in a nice area. And so those are blessings. They're not bummers. Yeah. They are good things. But it's very easy to make a good thing a God thing. And you can make family or your position a good thing. Yeah. Well, I'm not risking it. Uh, I'm here. I mean, my kid's four months old. How God would never. Yeah. So I think that's interesting and notable that, you know, my my grandfather used to say, be firmly flexible. And mm. we know Chuck Smith used to say, blessed are the flexible. flexible. So that ability to pivot, you know, um, mm. it's kind of like Adrian Rogers. I don't know if you remember Adrian Rogers, a well-known Baptist preacher from a generation ago that just said, wherever you are, be there for the next 50 years and for only the next five minutes, That's you know, well that, that dynamic really to, yeah. Lord, I'm here. I'm not, I'm not looking over. I'm not trying to wheel and deal, mm-hmm. but also if you say I'm done, I'm done. That's right. Um, it's the only way to live free in yeah. my opinion and to live focused is the mm-hmm. only way I know how to do it. So, that's good. Um, it's neat that you guys have that as a part of your resume, you know, because yeah. one of the worst parts of life is to look back and go, if I just would have tried. And uh, mm-hmm. not to digress here, but I remember Nate Wagner, a conversation I had with Nate when I was praying about Destin. You know, it's not very far from where we are sitting in Gulf Breeze, but there were eight people, a part of Calvary, Destin, as it was known at that time. And uh, my father and the leadership here had indicated, you know, Neil, we really think you should pray about this. And I was like, hey, people, like mm. an hour away. Long story. We couldn't sell our house for a certain amount of time. We were going to be commuting for three years. And I remember, you know, to your point about friends, yeah. like I had called yeah. Nate and I just said, Nate, I don't know what to do. And he just, you know, he probably eat an apple at the time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like, he said, would you regret not going? Like, uh, would you I ever, that. you know? I and I was that. like, well, then, yeah. And he goes, well, it seems like you know what you're supposed to do. See ya. That's like, right. That's all it took. It was like, I would Is regret when... not trying. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I could try and fail, but at least I know. Like, I tried. And um, that was a very pivotal moment for me because um, my wife and I, we had a one-year-old at the time. Yeah. But um, I just don't know that I want to live the shoulda, woulda, coulda. You know, I'd rather mm-hmm. live the, yeah, I failed. Oh, well. Yeah, I'm getting back up. We tried it. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that's encouraging. I mean, you took a little bit bigger step than I did. You went from the West Coast to the Emerald Coast. Mm-hmm. And then three years later, you take another coastal well, situation. Yeah. You went from the Emerald Isle to the Emerald Coast because you and I walked through a pastoral transition in Destin. But yeah. maybe just to tell us a little bit about Ireland and what you're doing now, you know, just to kind of bring us what was Ireland like. Okay. And now, so that's almost a six year time sure, frame. Sure. But um, um, just what it was like to church plant there. And I don't know, anything you'd have to, to say or share about Ireland. Mm. And then maybe we could kind of land at where God has you now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Ireland was an amazing experience. I, I was telling Ryan and the guys in here before, it was one of the most difficult things we ever done. Mm. 
but also the most amazing thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm I, again looking back. I'm so grateful God allowed us mm. to go there and experience that in a mm. at a very dominant Roman Catholic country, mm. socialist country. Mm. Uh, learning the culture, the people. Um, there's so much you, you learn. Your eyes open up to the world. Mm-hmm. It's a big world, and and also the church. I I was sharing to them just uh, the the experience in Ireland really helped me uh, see the church is huge. It's not just you know the people in Santa Barbara, California. You know, or mm-hmm. it's 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 beautiful. The church is. I appreciate the church. I think I. Um, I didn't value it maybe as much as I do now because of my experience. Gone. The local church, yeah. especially when, when you're a receiver from there and their mm-hmm. support, their prayer, and all the love that they give you. What a what a great experience to to have there. Um, and then another one was being in Ireland. When you do take that step, you experience God's faithfulness, like you like I never did ever in my life. Mm-hmm. For Him to show up, show up, provide, provide and see all that he accomplished and did mm. by just being available and trusting him and being faithful in the little. He mm. really can do a lot. And that was that's what I learned, I think, the, just how amazing the body of Christ is. So mm. if you're not in a body of Christ, please yeah. do. That's yeah. very important. Yeah. And then secondly, always, God is trustworthy and he's so faithful. I think it was Corey Ten Boom, and again, I don't know exactly, but just the phrase and the mindset, and I'll butcher this quote, that, You'll never really realize that God is all you need until he's all that you have. Oh, perfect. And so that dynamic of, you know, any character in the Old Testament or New Testament mm-hmm. that goes through that season of, of breaking yeah. or solitude or desert or loneliness, that is a part of the ingredients, if you're making a cake, right. of that ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, there has to be that to mm-hmm. where you recognize, God, you're here I'm, yeah. and I'm here. Yeah. And uh if I'm the only one, or right. like I mean, not that you're ever the only one. We know that, but, but you that feel sense that way sometimes, that like, especially Lord, in a country like that. I've made a decision. That's I'm right. here. Like you just kind of quell any other um, distractions or things that you could rely on, yeah. like good things, like I got a big family or I've got yes. this church or um, no, Lord, you're what I have. Mm-hmm. So that's an amazing thing. Yeah. But then Ireland was fruitful. I mean, I know we in Gulf Breeze, other churches from Colorado. Yeah. You, you were like hosted yeah, so many had. teams that would come and serve alongside you. Mm-hmm. What yeah. did you find to be most effective there oh, as an American yeah, coming to Ireland? And like, how did how do you connect there? Yeah. What do you do? Well, Team we were, biscuits, we were blessed mean. with a lot of churches came around us, would come visit us, you guys including. Um, we tried all kinds of things for outreach. Again, Remember we you, did the street stuff. Yeah, sh- street the, stuff. And I was going to get to, I think that is the oh, best. Oh, you think so that is? Okay. If I were to pick anything, even music was good, but... We came across this man. Um, from he's Colorado? From, no, from Calvary oh. Chapel, South Bay. Oh, South Bay. Yeah. So Jeff Gill now, I think, is there oh, okay. in his church. So my good friend Pat Shore brought a great team from South Bay, came out. And in that group was a guy named Frank. And he was part of, I think it was called Open Air Evangelism, oh, something like that. Yeah. And what his ministry was, just a nonprofit, and they're throughout the world, is they set up this kind of uh, little easel with a kind of a, a painting, and there's right. a story in that painting, and you you basically kind of tell it as there's people in front of you, and then they get to participate trying mm-hmm. to get the answers Answer as you questions. share the story. It was engaging. It I was. remember being there in whatever it's called, Galway Square or yep. something. Or Shop Street, Shop wherever Street. we were. Yeah, that's where we were. Yeah, and the people would stop. Totally. And then go, ah. Or, oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. You know? And a, a lot would, would be there until maybe you got to the the cross, yes, sin, that is interesting. The blood, you mentioned that. All those things. But um, it was... It was very well done, and and people would always say, "I've you know, hearing the gospel when we when we got to it." He goes, "They always say I've never heard the gospel be presented like that," mm. and that that's a lot of Europeans. So whatever they heard, I don't know, but it was clear they understood it. They saw the need that they had of a savior. They saw that how powerful the blood is by washing all sins away. They saw that there was an eternity. They saw, you know, what comes when sin isn't taken care of, mm-hmm. you know, and judgment mm-hmm. and and condemnation, all those things. Mm-hmm. And so it was a great time, and we had the best conversations down there. And mm-hmm. what I loved about Galway was it was like a little miniature Los Angeles, a melting pot. You had mm-hmm. Eastern Europeans, you had Afghanistans, you had people from Asia, you had people very, from um, all, very diverse. Very diverse yeah. and very committed to the arts. 
Like oh, yeah, like arts, the, music, yeah. food. It was yeah, a really lots of festivals, fun. Yeah, festivals. Yeah. Beautiful it, architecture. I mean, Christopher Columbus, Columbus wasn't he there yeah. before he came this way? Yeah, we had a church there in the 1300s. Wow. That he went to and you know prayed supposedly before yeah. he went it's off. It's a neat place but. for your kids to be able to experience too, just as a dad, yeah. you know, to be able to kind of expose them to the world's a lot bigger than just where grandma and grandpa live or That's something. That's right. You know? yeah. That's right. So you were there for three years. Three years. I remember um, things changed in Europe with visas mm -hmm. around that third year. Yeah. And that's right around the same time I had been in Haiti and uh, really felt kind of a call from the Lord to kind of bring my time of investing in Destin uh, to a close. And mm -hmm. this is before you and I had even talked about, I mean, I'd served with you in Ireland, known you for years, but didn't know you were really entertaining the potential of having to pray about your next season, be that yeah. elsewhere in Europe or, I mean, I know your sister's a missionary in New Zealand, New Zealand you know, yeah. um, didn't know what the Lord had, but um, I remember mentioning to you, you know, I really feel like the Lord has me going to, to Gulf Breeze and you're like, awesome. You know? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I remember you visited one time and- Yeah, it was uh, like a summer. Yeah, summer, visiting. you guys just came kind of as missionaries, you're on summer yeah, break, break or something. And I remember you told your wife, at least as I've heard it, told <laughs> yeah. Rebecca, like you guys are leaving the Dustin Bridge after your vacation. You're like, well, we'll never go there again. You know? <laughs> like there yeah, was, it was that week with all the gnats. Yeah, there were gnats. We I had this lumps place. of mosquito bite. I was like, dude, I'll never come back to this place again. <laughs> and now you're living here. Yeah, uh, you've now been here I three live years. here. But you transitioned um, from- the Emerald Isle to the Emerald Coast, yes. we like to say. So now you're in the, the Emerald of the Emerald Coast, mm -hmm. Destin, Florida. You're pastoring Coastline Destin, which my wife and I had a great opportunity to be a part of from mm. January 10th, 2010 to April 29th, 2019. Okay. That was our season there. Um, but maybe walk us through a little bit of that. I mean, you don't have to go through all the dynamics of what happened in Ireland with the visas. It wasn't like you yeah. went through a disqualification or anything. It's just, hey, no. the government changed. We can't yeah, be here. Yeah, they changed their policies. Their, what yeah. was that like for you as a family? I mean, because yeah. you went from the <clears throat> West Coast to the you know, Emerald Isle to the Emerald Coast. I mean, that's a lot of change you know, for your change, family. Yeah. So what was that like to come off the mission field or yeah. be back in a... I mean, Coastline Destin um, has been used by God to help other churches start. Sure. And, but it's not um, 8 million people there. You know, it's a, it's a tight-knit church. Yeah. You know, kind of know most people, and yeah. it's a good family-style church. And what was that like, coming off the mission field? and Because mm. you and I went through about an 18-month transition mm -hmm. when we started talking about leadership. It was. We didn't make it fast. Yeah. We, we wanted to make it fruitful. Yeah. And uh, I think I've always shared with you, I, I value relationship over position. And you and I have known each other since 2001. Mm -hmm. If you stepped into Destin and felt, you know, Neil, this just isn't it for me. We wanted to structure it in a way where the, the relationship could at least had the potential to survive. Because yeah. yeah. sometimes in church, um, I've heard people say it's a dangerous thing to serve in a church you love or mm -hmm. to serve with friends, you know, because there can be this nature and sometimes in church ministry where, um, I mean, if we're just, it can be hard. Mm -hmm. And like, it's easy for the culture of a church to become toxic or... Mm -hmm. For it, you know, it's like that thing. Never make your friends your roommates or something. Because like, oh, that's different to share toothpaste with somebody. We did. Like, we did. <laughs> we made it. We <laughs> We're navigated. Still friends. Yeah. But there's some dynamics for some that's yeah. like, you know, the old phrase: never meet your heroes or never get too. And so I've always said, well, I want relationship to matter more than can you fill this position? Can you do this job? Yeah. Because positions change. I mean, All the lo time. locations change, but your character your relationships, they, they don't have to, you mm -hmm. know, you can maintain those. Um, so what was that like for your family? Was it easy coming off the mission field? Was it challenging? Mm. Um, yeah, good. how would you speak to someone coming off the mission field? Would mm -hmm. you have any advice? Um, and then we can talk a little bit about pastoral transition after that. But okay. what was that like? I mean, you guys yeah. were there just going yeah. for it in yeah. Ireland. Uh, that's where I'll probably start. Just if we were coming to our last year. We, we did our paperwork. We, we wanted to stay. We were open to stay. You know, also, though, we, we maybe knew by that time, Neil, that we weren't maybe going to be there forever. Mm -hmm. But we knew we had some good momentum. God was working. The church was formed. Good things were happening. So I was like, man, we're staying. And I, I, we wanted to stay, so we appealed. Um, we did everything possible. But things changed in the immigration process, UK and Ireland, and, and uh, we just could not stay. So they said, you got to head out. And in that time, too, when we were waiting, you know, it was interesting. Different discussions came about, like from California. Hey, would you ever want to come? I, you know, there's like four maybe options. Right. 
you know, as we're thinking about, okay, where we got our paperwork in, but we're not sure we may have to leave. So yeah. Lord, Lord, we God should, for you we need to look, you know, and pray. And so there are some options, but all those doors closed. And, and then again, you said to pray about Destin. Mm-hmm. And at that time, you know, the first I said, no. You're right. I remember that. And I was like, all remember right. Remember that? I guess we're not friends. <laughs> but after after months, all those doors closed. Destin was the place. And again, God used you to, mm-hmm. to begin that. And uh, so it became, what, January? That was 2018, I mm-hmm. think it was. We That's packed right. our bags. We had three weeks to kind of delegate everything. We had Jim Arnold and mm-hmm. Lori there. Mm-hmm. So that was really good. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like, okay, Lord, this is what you're doing. It was, it was smooth. It was hard, though. So getting to your question, though. Yes, I would say it's for a missionary, it's harder to leave there than going there. I would say it's more emotional. It's it's hard leaving those people that, you know, especially that organic work that you saw blossom. Well, you're probably you, so you excited poured your life on in. the front end, like, man, we're going to a new thing. Yeah. And then to leave it is to hard. To leave it's hard. And so we knew, okay, Lord, you, I don't know all the answers, but we're, we're obedient. We're going to follow you. We're going to Destin. So we packed our bags, got to Destin. And those first few months were great, but very emotional tears. I yeah. remember being in my kitchen table late at night and all just a flood of memories from Ireland would come and tears would fall. And you're like, oh, Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't understand, but I, I do know that this is where we're supposed to be. Well, my wife and I can resonate with that. We didn't take a big, we didn't cop the pond like you did. Mm-hmm. But we did go over a couple bridges yeah. to get to Destin. And I know even though we knew the Lord led us from Destin, it, it took some time it did. to let Destin, let, or let us let go of Destin, if that That's makes right. any sense. Like, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, but when I decided to leave and that we finally moved and bought a house... And then bought another house, then moved again. Oh, Took yeah. a while to find another <laughs> house. But I made a commitment not to really reach out to you or to even step into Destin for at least a year. Because I felt like, you know, to pay honor and respect to Jess, it would be unhelpful if I was, how's it going with so-and-so? How's, what's this ministry? I mean, if I'm going to leave, I need to leave, mm-hmm. you know. And so I didn't even go into Destin for a cheeseburger, you know, for a whole year. Which, if you know me, I like cheeseburgers. <laughs> <laughs> but after a year was up, I was like, no. But um, but it was hard to leave because it felt yeah, like, hard. but we had three children here. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the longest town I've ever lived mm-hmm. in, Destin. Um, my life was there. And so I can resonate with that. I mean, not to the same level that you did with having to live in a sheep farm. You know, I didn't have to do that. But just that dynamic of leaving something that you've invested in, I guess is what I'm trying to speak to. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's okay that it's hard. It's hard. It, yeah. It's and it's okay. You're part right. of the process. Yep. It's not, it didn't make a mistake or it's just part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, like I heard one pastor once say, feelings are meant to be felt. Mm-hmm. And when there's a loss, allow there to be grief. Mm-hmm. Cause if you stuff it, it'll come out in unhealthy ways, yeah. addictions to things or yeah. inappropriate relationships. But if there's a death, or if there's a change or a transition, it's okay to feel sad. That's right. You know, emotions come from God. God's mm-hmm. an emotional God. It's okay. F- ma- feelings are meant to be felt. And so you don't get over them, you, you get through them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's been um, helpful to us. Again, I don't mean to derail no, the conversation. No, it's good. And, and yeah, feelings, yeah, definitely emotions are good. Tears are good. It's all part of the process. And what's 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 neat is in those times of the the tears and looking back, God, you know, he would meet with me, though, there. That's right. Like he did going to Ireland. I remember mm-hmm. when, before I moved my family so far across the world to mm-hmm. go there, he met me in the Dublin airport. I was walking out of the terminal because we were doing that prayer walk that, mm-hmm. you know, the year before. Mm-hmm. And he just hit me. I said, Lord, is this where I'm supposed to be? And, and with that powerful, still voice, he said, this is your new home. Mm-hmm. That's all I needed that's to know. Yeah. And that's what he did here. Yeah, I don't have all the answers, but he met me and says, this is your new place, mm. new home. Mm. Okay, that's all I need to know. So you and I walked through, you moved to, to Destin, Florida, mm-hmm. January, February <clears throat> of uh, 2018, February 3rd, 2018. Yeah, uh, yeah February 3rd, you're right. February it was 3rd. February, yeah. And then we had some gracious people in Destin. Very. Someone gave you a beach house for a couple of weeks. Can we weeks. say his name in this? We or? can say anybody. Chad Horton. Chad Horton. Thanks what for a, that. Chad, Chad thank we you. you we love you. Yeah, you're wonderful. What a blessing. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> so you had a beach house. I mean, you kind of bounced around a little bit, and you bought your very first house. Yeah, I never thought I'd Which as a Californian, either. like, yeah. can't never. afford you, California. You know, that's <laughs> yeah, kind of what it is. Exist. <laughs> that should be a phrase. Can't <laughs> afford you, California. But anyway, um, you bought a home. You bought two cars. I mean, like, you got settled for a season. We didn't like, okay, Jess. 
I'm leaving tomorrow. Get yeah. get it figured out. Like by God's grace, you were able to kind of slowly ease back mm-hmm. into ministry, helping with like students or you know, maybe helping with kids or, you know, we just kind of took it slow. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, you gave me remember that it's, I love it. And I think other ministers, pastors and churches should do it. But when someone comes on, you, you allowed that six months, was it? Yeah. Remember it's that, what do you call it? The, just uh, kind of a trial, trial, you know, yeah, time kind of a, let's feel it out. Yeah. You could say yes or no. And right. I could say yes. Or and no. there's so no harm, no foul. There's no harm or foul. It was a yep. freedom, man. I, th- I think every church should apply that. Well, I think that's margin. You know, a lot of people live their life without margin in many realms, be yeah. it financial or even yeah. their calendar. Their calendar is so planned out. It's like yeah. there's no room for flexibility. You just can't live without margin. I mean, a plan, I say this a thousand times, probably said it on another podcast. A plan is a great tool, but a terrible master. Mm-hmm. You, you know, <laughs> this is a quote from Baby Boss, the movie, but either you run the day <laughs> or the day memorized. runs you. You know, like this kind of dynamic. Yeah. But like, but even that plan was like, hey, we need like, there has to be a little bit of, cushion here margin yes, like absolutely. we're not robots mm-hmm. you know we are people and mm-hmm. there's dynamics that happen so yeah, you have children life. that need to get into school and like all these realities yeah that, thank you for yeah, that. giving so us those couple months i think that dynamic gave all of us a sense because i remember um i think it was daniel fusco or bill ritchie when we were researching transitions mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. went up that. and did a trip one of those guys much smarter than us they said this um change is instantaneous but transitions happen over time, time. So That's give right. it some time. It's really good. Um, because it's new. Jess is here. That's an immediate change. Mm-hmm. But the transition for him to be in the South, mm-hmm. that's a new experience. Last time there were gnats everywhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, like this is a new thing. So um, we uh, just tried to build it out. I think it was about 18 months or 16 months. Yeah, just over. From where you were installed as the lead pastor, you know, the leadership of the church came around mm-hmm. you. We had a time where we recognized you as the lead pastor. Um, and then my family good. and I were there for maybe another good 30 days or something. And then we moved back to the original coastline, you know, coastline Gulf breeze where I'm serving right now and mm-hmm. where we're recording this little conversation. Um, but you know, now you've been the lead pastor for a little over two years. Yeah. So I guess this could be an awkward conversation, but like, how's it been it's cleaning been up great. my mess? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I left Dustin no, and then you came in like... <laughs> Things a couple things have changed, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but it's been a we great took that, like statue of me down. Like all the, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, it's been a great uh, new season. The church has been great, even from Neil and I didn't get to say this, but when we moved and coming overseas, people loved us yeah, and cared for church us. There. So generous, so hospitable. Mm-hmm. I mean, incredible, and I, I so appreciate them and you and and it's it's still the same. I, I think mm. we we. Um, take every opportunity the Lord gives, mm-hmm. and uh, we want to be faithful in it, just like the church in Philadelphia. They were, yeah. they were kind of small and uh, uh, didn't have much, I think he says, power or strength, but they, they took every open door or opportunity God gave them, and mm-hmm. they're faithful to it, and that's what we it. are. And so uh, it's been great, great leadership, uh, great elders, staff, and all those who serve. It's, it's been uh, awesome. So kind of as we wrap up this conversation a little bit, um, you know, just hearing your story, you've been blessed with so many different experiences Mm -hmm. in ministry from one day a week with Rick Soto to now leading a church. I mean, it's pretty amazing to hear the the 20 year journey. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for all of us. It is a journey. Who knows what the next 20 years hold for any of us. But um, in any of those seasons, someone that's listening is bound to be going through that season. I'm Mm -hmm. at the one day a week season or I'm at the. Now I'm mm. the kids guy. Now I'm working at my first church plan. Now I'm planning a church. Now I am a lead pastor of a, of a church. Whatever. I mean, there always will be uniqueness to every story, but I don't know that it's um. It'll still follow that similar pattern. Yeah. You know, where God gives you more and more responsibility, different seasons. Is there any one of those seasons or any specific time that you feel like the Lord has given you a sense of wisdom or lesson learned or something that you would go, man wish I would have known this, you know, mm-hmm. at, if I, when I was the one day a week guy yeah. <laughs> or mm-hmm. when I was the missionary in Ireland mm-hmm. in hindsight, because, you know, clarity, foresight is fuzzy. Mm-hmm. doesn't come clarity, but hindsight brings clarity. Oh, now I can, I'll say this just as an example. There was a season at Coastline Destin where we'd had a youth ministry and it was fruitful and thriving, taking mission trips, all these wonderful things. Mm-hmm. And then there was a season we didn't. Mm -hmm. And I went through a hiring process with a couple different guys, a couple different candidates. And um, 
I felt like we tried to go slow, interview, do things well, do things right. And the Lord just did not really provide mm-hmm. the individual that we felt, this is the youth pastor for Coastline Dustin. Mm-hmm. And I remember being a little bit frustrated, like, Lord, what's the deal? <laughs> like, yeah. We're yeah. doing everything I we're supposed to that. do. Yeah. Like, we're going for a good goal here. We're trying to care for the kids. Mm-hmm. You're not providing. Mm-hmm. What is wrong? Mm. That's a, yeah, and then when that. we transitioned and you came on, I said, oh, that's why, Lord. Because had we brought on a youth pastor, mm-hmm. I don't know that we'd have been able to afford to bring on a transitional pastor. And also it would have been a hard fit for, for the n- incoming pastor to go, okay, well, is this the youth pastor that I can work with? Or, That's right. So the Lord's saying no to something yeah. that I felt like you should be saying yes to this, Lord. Mm-hmm. It was the timing. The timing was wrong. Because a month after I leave, mm-hmm. Big Bearded Roger shows up, <laughs> who's like the best youth pastor that's ever been ever yeah, alive. It was. He it's... shows up right in the right time. Yeah. You know, he left, I think, in the spring. He came in the fall. Yeah. He's been on staff with you a year ever and a half, since. two years yeah, or something. Yeah, almost two years. Yeah. And so when I saw all that, I said, well, there it is. Like, Lord, if you would have provided Roger when I was there, I would have never left. Mm. Oh, I got Roger, you know. But like um, you told me no. Um, even though it seemed like you were withholding a good thing from me, Lord, yeah, yeah. but you weren't. Because John Corson once told me, Neil, in order to be the man God uses, right time, right place, right person, all three must align. You could mm-hmm. be the right guy in the right place, but it could be the wrong time. Yeah. One of those three doesn't work. Two of those three doesn't work. <clears throat> three out of three. So, I mean, that was a lesson I learned. Was like, It's a great lesson. I think hindsight. we can end our time right now with that. <laughs> <laughs> what else? But I don't know. I mean, any lessons that you would learn, and then we'll just wrap well, it yeah, up in a little I, bit. But yeah. There's, there's many. Um, you know, if you're in ministry, if you're, if you're a pastor, if you're a missionary, this kind of can apply to all of them. Is don't, I've learned, at least, you know, from Ireland till now, especially, kind of, go, I think, goes along with what you said, is don't get ahead of the Lord. Yeah. Be patient. Yeah. Don't get ahead, because every time, and you probably, have, you know, have done this too, but you get ahead, and it just doesn't go Mm-mm. well. And so... Yeah, let go go along with the Lord when when He's leading, you follow. Mm. Um, I think another one. Um, <laughs> I, I actually brought this, and I'm. It's a book by R. Kent Hughes, a mm. great commentary writer, author. Oh yeah, he's great. He's great, and um, this has been another one. Just I think it's on my heart to share, and maybe next time we can talk more about it. But John Miller, my mentor, introduced mm. me to this right before Ireland, mm. and. Um, you know, for I think if you're in ministry, if you again you're a missionary, um, or just in serving in ministry, it's called liberating ministry from the success syndrome. And I think naturally, yes, we feel this need like I need to be successful. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, like myself, before I read this book, my perspective or my outlook on success it was completely not right Mm. it was unhealthy Mm. which caused a lot of health issues stress anxiety and it just it began to destroy me i like that you brought the book okay because when we were here with our friend (laughs) nate (laughs) he's gone uh which one nate tell me one of the books yeah like howard hendrix uh, (laughs) (laughs) and that is a good one (laughs) (laughs) you actually brought the book (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but if, if you don't have it, it's a great one. We read it as pastors back in so- Southern California. I'm actually Ooh. taking my staff to it right now. Yeah. But basically, he, he, he starts his book saying, I see so many pastors leave the ministry mm-hmm. because they have this, this perspective, like this is how ministry should be. This mm-hmm. is where I need to be at. Mm-hmm. And so they don't see that. And so I'm out. They, mm-hmm. they just leave and quit or other bad things happen. And so... Let me just go with your yeah, real quick I'd to love the page. This is, um, he says what, what success is in a ministry is it's being faithful, serving, loving, believing, prayer, holiness, attitude. That's right. And so he goes on to say, and of course he, he does such a good job explaining more in depth of those. But And that's not a new author. I mean, those no, guys have contributed he's been so around, many wonderful things. Oh, yeah. He's been Christendom. around forever. I yeah, think there's he a, was, a book on family or something that they wrote with mm-hmm. parenting, if memory serves me right. And I think maybe the, what is it, The Disciplines of a Godly Man, mm. he might have written as well. But yeah, he's, a, he's definitely he's a great incredible writer. author. Very much One so. who speaks with an element yeah. of weight to his words. You know? Not a Calvary guy, but no, he's a yeah. like-minded guy. And he's yeah. got great nuggets, especially, uh, you know, practical things to keep you. The goal is, I, I want to run the long race. It's not a sprint, mm-hmm. it's a marathon. 
Uh, God has called us to run the long race. Mm -hmm. And if you have a good perspective on what success is in the ministry, Mm -hmm. you'll be able to actually finish well. I heard a pastor recently say that integrity, the way it works with integrity is life only gets sweeter the more integrity you have. Mm -hmm. But the less integrity you have, the harder things get and eventually you have to leave. But if you have integrity, the sweeter things get and then you get to experience that Psalm 1 lifestyle of the tree planted beside the rivers of living water. But um, yeah. but integrity, the great thing about integrity is you and I can have that. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm never going to be over six foot something dunking a basketball. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to be the Phil Wickham. I'm never going to be the whoever the name is or whatever you That's determine right. That's right. to be success. But I can make good choices. Mm-hmm. And I can be faithful. That's and right. I can show up. And if I'm going to be good at anything, I'm going to be good at being consistent. That's and it. Like, That's it. And if those are things, the thing that I love about that, though, is like, anyone can do this like, anybody this isn't like for the select few mm-hmm. or just those that man, like i really knows how to communicate mm-hmm. i mean i'll just never be like that but that's not who wins that's, that's not right. who stays that's not who's it's the ones that just say I'll, I'll serve uh, i'll be available and that's, that's what right. I, maybe this is where this ends is like right where you and i met like mm-hmm. we were so blessed to be able to serve in a ministry where it wasn't really about us it was about those kids mm-hmm. It wasn't really about us as our young 20s wanting to like wear skinny jeans and whatever. Yeah, oh, we gotta be in the trendy. We were like doing kids camps. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I mean, people cared about it, but I don't know that a lot of people were looking to us for, you know, ministry direction or, I mean, you, Nate and I, these three guys that lived in this 600 square foot place called Curly Avenue. It's interesting to see what's happened 20 years later. Yeah, like how yeah. we're, all three of us are in this position that none of us probably ever thought we would Never be in, imagined. but we all lead churches. We all, <clears throat> by God's grace, have beautiful wives and children and families, and I mean, we own homes. Like we're contributing members to society. <laughs> like, <laughs> like who would have ever thought? Paying those, taxes. <laughs> yeah, paying taxes, and like <laughs> we have cars, and um, people ask, like, actually ask us questions, thinking we know the answers. Like mm-hmm. uh, it's just you, it's just interesting. I don't know too many other situations like that where. By God's grace, at least at the moment of this recording, yeah, we're still walking faithfully with the Lord, and um, may yeah, may we continue to yeah. Do. And I think if we just keep it daily, you know, and good friendships are helpful; they're necessary because, like you and I have mentioned, God's used different people ourselves in one another's yeah. lives, but just different people, you know, to kind of oh no, maybe think about this or biting the apple, saying go for That's it, right. you know, or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, it just right. has to be available. Uh, well, That's man, good. thank you for coming to Golf Breeze. Thank um, you, bro. For all of you that are tuning in and just gleaning all these pearls of wisdom from Jess, glad that you're here. Um, and uh, Coastline Destin. So this last question I'd ask, yep. if people wanted to stay connected to you in ministry, just tell us the name mm. of your church website or yeah. where you guys are located. I mean, if they're in the Destin area or how do they find out more about what God's doing through the McKernan family or cool. what church you're a part yeah. of? That'll if you're good. in Destin, it's a great place to visit, isn't sure it? Sure is, man. <laughs> Wonderful spot. Yeah. White sand and beautiful water. Um, you can find us on, what are we now? We're coastlinedestin.com, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, you can email me at jess at coastlinelife.com. Um, I'm not much of, I'm not on the, the social or that media too much, but um, What's your get, website? Yeah. yeah, go to the website. Phone number's there. Information's there. And we'd love to have you in Dustin. Perfect. Thanks for being here. You got it, buddy. All right.